If you did bring your Bible today, we'll be in Luke chapter 11. And uh, you can turn that and be ready. You know, it's not hard to remember a desperate moment in your life because those are pretty imprinted on your brain. You know, my first kidney stone attack was one of those moments for me in a matter of moments. Uh, I went from watching Power Ranger uh, with my daughter in my lap to barely hovering uh, over the commode vomiting due to pain. I was sweating profusely. I was scared and my wife was right there with me. Um, we lived in Irvin, Kentucky at the time, so uh, we climbed into the van to travel the 20 miles uh, to Richmond uh, to the hospital. And I remember taking the ride, being bent over the whole trip, praying with my head on the dashboard because I was in so much pain, wondering if I was really going to make it or not. When we arrived, they waited on us pretty quickly, which I was very grateful for. Uh, I think one look at me told them I was in tremendous distress and uh, really needed some help. After a urine sample, they told me that I probably had a kidney stone. That really didn't help me any other than letting me know I probably wasn't going to die even though I felt like I was. And um, all I know is that I was desperate for that pain to go away. Whatever you've got to do, make it go away. You know, you have your own vivid memories of desperate moments, many of them worse than anything I've described this morning to help introduce our topic for today. You know, sometimes our desperate times are sustained things that we feel very powerless to change, and we feel like we're in way over our heads. Some of you are doing jobs at work that three people used to do. And if you ask for help or you say something about the company giving you more help to do this um, job that's overwhelming, usually you hear something really sympathetic like there's a lot of people that would like to have your job. Um, you know, sympathy oozing everywhere, oh thanks. Um, some of you can't find a job. And uh, it, it's just tough and you feel like economically right now you're in way over your head. Maybe your marriage is in trouble or one of your kids is completely out of control and you don't know what to do and you're in way over your head. Maybe you've had all the treatments for your medical condition and nothing seems to be really working and you feel like you're in way over your head. Or you're preparing to graduate from high school and all your friends know exactly what they want to do with their lives and you're the one that doesn't have a clue what you want to do for your life and you are desperate for some kind of guidance, some direction that makes sense for you. Or someone in, of significance in your life is gone and the loneliness at times is just overwhelming. You know, what do you do when you're in life situations where you feel like you're in over your head, that you're just desperate, so desperate for help? What do you do? The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, says something of, of great importance. I'm reading from the J.B. Phillips translation, where he says there, when trials come, endure them patiently steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. Paul is reminding us very simply in that verse that trials come for everybody. None of us are exempt. Maybe we feel like we haven't near, had nearly as many as someone else, but your life's not over yet. They're going to come. And for most of you, they already have. Maybe in multiples. Paul says, endure them patiently. And never stop praying. Keep praying. Develop the habit of praying. Be consistent about praying no matter what. Jesus prayed often when he lived on this earth as one of us. It's a very common theme as we read about his life in the Gospels that he spent a great deal of time in prayer. The disciples watched Jesus get up early in the morning to pray, and sometimes when they got up, he was already gone to pray. And often they watched him as he fasted and prayed. As he got in a boat and traveled to the other side of a lake and got out to pray. 
It was a common theme of his life. It was part of his life flow, his life fabric. He understood the importance of a strong relationship with his father. You know, the disciples prayed too, um, but they noticed something very distinctive about the prayer life of Jesus, the one who steadfastly maintained the habit of prayer. And so they said to Jesus one day, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. Lord, in other words, they were saying, teach us how to pray like you. Why? Because we want the results that you get. And so Jesus gave him a, a motto prayer. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. A lot of you could just speak it from memory as we talk about it. But evidently the disciples weren't sure that God would listen to their prayers and answer their prayers in the same way that he did with Jesus. And it's implied in the story that followed that Jesus told. But they were kind of thinking, maybe God answers Jesus' prayer differently than he answers our prayers. You know, I think they're really, really close, you know. And I think that's kind of like we are today. You know, we kind of think that God listens to some people's prayers more than ours. For whatever that reason is, we think they're... Um, they're closer to God or something. You know, I don't know how many times somebody has looked at me and said, Preacher, you've got the hotline to God. Would you pray for this? Like, you know, I've got the bat phone or something, you know, with me all the time. And, yeah, it's just a direct line for me. The rest of you got to wait. You know, I'm sorry. Yeah. But, you know, that's not true. You have the ear of God just as I have the ear of God when I pray in Jesus' name and you pray in Jesus' name. But sometimes I think as humans, we look around us and think, well, that person, probably God listens to them more than me. Disciples were no different. So Jesus gave them a story to help their understanding of prayer. If you're looking in your outline today on the back of the bulletin, there's three points that I want to share with you today uh, as we talk about what Jesus um, elaborated on in this teaching about prayer in Luke 11. The first thing is sometimes desperate needs aren't met with the hope for response. It's not met with the hope for response. Jesus told a story about a man receiving an unexpected guest from out of town at midnight. You know, that really late time in the middle of the night when some of you are still up, most of you have been in bed for hours because you're smart. But this man is hungry and as this guy who answered the door thinks, he realizes that there's no food in the house. You know, when we read this story, we think it's quite strange because we wouldn't show up at a stranger's house and ask for food, much less do it at midnight. You know, we kind of look at that and think, I don't understand this story. I mean, this has got to be some joke, right? Where's the punchline? But you know, travelers in Palestine at this particular time often traveled as the sun began setting because they traveled everywhere on foot. The heat was oppressive in Palestine. There wasn't a lot of shade trees, and so they would wait till later in the day to begin traveling. And so they would show up in in towns they had never been in before, a stranger, and need to go to someone and seek some hospitality, some food, maybe some lodging. And so that's what this fella has done. And so this guy answers his door at midnight, and he hears this man's story, and everything in his heart wants to help this man. It was a dishonor to be a poor host. Still is, in a sense. But this guy's desperate. He needs food. He's hungry. Midnight or not. There's no 24-hour Kroger, Myers, Walmart, you know, none of those kinds of things. He's dependent on people like this man. And so this guy decides that he's got to go find some food. And so he wanders to his neighbor's house and knocks on the door. Now it's a little after midnight. And he's trying to wake up this neighbor. And the guy finally answers the door, and he says, Oh, I'm so sorry to bother you at this hour. I know it's late, but this man came unexpectedly from out of town. He's hungry. He's been traveling all day. He has nothing to eat. We ate everything at dinner tonight, you know, my family. And we don't have anything to feed him. 
can I borrow a few loaves of bread from you? And this neighbor doesn't want to get up. He doesn't want to wake up his family. He's answering him from the bed. He doesn't want to respond to this guy's need. Verse 7 of Luke 11, Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now for the guy who has the guy at his front door who has wandered over to his neighbors and is hoping in some way to get some sympathy from this guy, has got to feel very frustrated because basically the guy's saying, no, I'm not going to give you anything. Go away. And I think all of us who've been frustrated at times in our lives about things we have prayed about can feel some of this guy's desperation some of his frustration. Those times when you you turn to God in the desperation of your need and you lay it out before Him the way you're supposed to and you wait for an answer and you don't notice one. And you keep praying and there's no answer. And you pray more and there's no answer. And you begin to get frustrated in your desperation. Many of you prayed and your health didn't improve. Or the marriage isn't working any better. Or the desire for alcohol isn't going away. Or the pregnancy test is still negative. You know, I don't know why God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want Him to. But there are some things we see in the Bible that help us to better understand God's answers to prayer. For instance, we know from the Bible that sometimes we ask for the wrong things. We don't always know what is best for us. We think we do. And that's what we pray, and, and we should. But Jesus says here in Luke 11, 11 through 12, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. You know, no loving parent is going to give their kids something that will bite or poison them. The parent is going to use good judgment and discretion. Jesus said that's what parents do. Your father, your heavenly father will do the same. You know, if your four-year-old decides that he or she is in charge of the dinner menu and lets you know that tonight we're going to have ice cream donuts and cotton candy for supper. But as a loving parent, you don't give them that because it's not what they need. You're going to give them something that's healthier for them. It's good for them. You know, sometimes we just ask God for the wrong things. We often ask God to change some other person that's giving us a lot of trouble in our lives. But maybe we need to be asking God to change us. The Bible also mentions that sometimes we pray with the wrong motives. A mother of two of Jesus' disciples came to him one time with a very small request. She simply wanted to know when Jesus came in power in his kingdom, if one of her sons could sit on Jesus' left and one of them could sit on his right. Just a small thing. And Jesus told her that she didn't even know what she was talking about. He told her that mine is the way of the cross, the way of suffering. My way is of selfless servanthood. And you want to elevate your voice? You're worried about honor motive. James put it this way, and even when you ask, you don't get because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. But also sometimes we ask in the wrong timing. We ask for the right thing, but we ask at the wrong time. We often remind each other when we talk about things that our our timing doesn't always match God's timing. And 
a lot of times we kind of want to nudge God toward our timing because it makes a lot more sense to us. We don't see the big picture at all. You know, sometimes the things we ask for, we are not mature enough yet to handle. We think we are. It's kind of like the 14-year-old that thinks that they should be able to get a driver's license. It's just not time. Someday it will be a good request. It's just not time yet. And sometimes when we come to God, we may have good requests, but the timing is wrong. And we need to be patient and trust God's time. But don't quit asking. Keep asking. Keep asking. The second point in your outline is that prayer seeks a relationship with God. Prayer seeks a relationship with God. The man who came seeking bread for his guest was disappointed when his neighbor didn't jump out of bed and help him, but he didn't give up. He didn't quit asking. And Jesus here is speaking about persistence in prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verse 8, But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. This guy just kept knocking. He just kept knocking. And he kept on asking. And it's kind of like, I'm going to be here knocking on your door. Do you do something? You don't want your kids to wake up? We're going to wake them up. I'm going to keep knocking unless you get up and do something here. And I think there's several things here that Jesus is teaching us about prayer. The first thing to think about is when the man with the guest needed help, to whom did he turn? He went next door to a neighbor who apparently was his friend. He went to someone that he already had an existing relationship with. Someone that he knew he could pester at midnight until he got up and helped him because they have a relationship. You know, you probably got some neighbors that it didn't matter what your need is, you probably wouldn't go to them. You know, those are those people that never wave at you when you drive by and wave at them. You're kind of left hanging. You know, they keep pretty much to themselves. They just don't integrate with the neighborhood. They, you just don't feel comfortable for some reason with those people. There's places you're not going to go, but there's places you will go. Those people that you have built a relationship, those, those neighbors that you look after each other and bring in each other's garbage cans, or you, you get mail for them when you're on vacation and they do that for you, and you know you stand at the back fence and you talk about life and, and what's going on, and you enjoy that and you build relationships. Those are the people you turn to who are your neighbors when you're desperate and when you're not. I think Jesus is trying to communicate that people who get answers to their prayers possess a personal relationship with God. And the reason some are frustrated with their prayers is because they don't have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And perhaps for some of you, until you do business with those facts, your prayer life is never going to be what it could be. Because you just don't understand. It's not a series of magic words. It's a relationship that yields a greater understanding and greater answers to prayers. The second thing Jesus teaches about prayer here is having a healthy sense of inadequacy. You know, this guy had to go to his friend next door and admit that he has a need that he cannot take care of on his own. Now, I'm knowing a lot of you and myself included that it's really hard sometimes when you need help to go to somebody and say, you know, I'm sorry, I just can't handle this. It's just over my head. I, I just really need your help. You know, for a lot of us, it's a pride hurdle that we have to jump over. We want to take care of this if we can on our own. And there's nothing wrong with that general attitude, but sometimes we're just so rock-headed, stubborn, we, even when we really, really, really need the help, we just, we're hesitant to ask. And this guy would have been just like that. But he was so desperate 
An effective praying always starts with a humble admission to God that I have a situation I can't take care of on my own. I need you. Put it right out there. A third thing Jesus is teaching about prayer is that God doesn't want to discourage your heartfelt passion for the subject that you are praying about. You know, God doesn't mind if you pour out your heart. He doesn't care if you shout at Him. He doesn't care if you, if you clench your fists and you, and you just cry and you just burst out in whatever emotion that you're having at the time. God isn't trying to discourage that. Verses 8 and 9, But I tell you this, although He won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, He'll get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Now let's ask the obvious question. Is Jesus saying that you need to badger God and, and pester God like this neighbor until he finally responds to your needs? And is God sitting up there saying, okay, if he asks me 45 more times, I'll answer his prayer. No. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. In fact, Jesus is contrasting that neighbor with God. He's saying that if an, if an imperfect, stubborn friend will get up in the middle of the night and respond to your need, how much more will a gracious God who loves you anything to help you he will respond in an even greater way and again this is the answer to those disciples who are thinking will, will God answer our prayers like he answers yours Jesus Jesus saying yes he will if these stubborn and perfect people will help you know that your gracious loving God will certainly help you the last thing on your outline is that prayer works primarily in two ways. Often in prayer, God changes circumstances, but if he doesn't change circumstances, he will often change you in prayer. He'll change circumstances or he'll change you. Sometimes God changes circumstances when we pray. Some of you remember the Old Testament story of the good king uh, Hezekiah who got deathly ill. He was on his deathbed and he was praying with all of his heart and his passion to God to, to help him to spare his life. And we know as we read this story that God granted him 15 more years of life. God changed the circumstances. He healed Hezekiah. But more often than not, prayer changes you. The Apostle Paul was sharing in 2 Corinthians 12 about something he had that he was praying to God about. He, be he begins in verse 7, the last part, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away, and each time he said, my grace is is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And God was telling Paul, I'm not taking this away from you. But my grace will take care of you. Do you remember when Jesus prayed in the garden in great agony that if there was a, another way to save people, Without the suffering of the cross, he was okay with it. He was for it. But you notice that God didn't change the circumstance. But he sent an angel to comfort Jesus. God either changes the circumstance or he changes you in prayer. And often we'd rather him change the circumstance. Because the changing of us seems so much harder for us, so much slow, it happens so much more slowly. I want to just share with you as we close today 
a challenge to those of you who are already members of the church or are believers in the Lord and are already enduring your own trials. I just want to encourage you with the call of Paul in Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 12, where we, we talked about earlier, to remember the verse, when trials come, endure them patiently, steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. I really, really hope in your life that you find yourself praying more often, praying to God about more things, making your day with Him a real journey with a companion, a companion who loves you and cares about you and loves to hear your heart and loves to take care of you. That's what He calls us to. And it is the believer's great strengthening when trials come. And I want to encourage you to do that when we live in a society where everything is help yourself. Keep that prayer going in your life. But for those of you who have not, Jesus invites you to enter a personal relationship with God through Him. That these prayers that that are so important and vital in your life and mine and, and can be in, in many of yours who have not yet made that commitment. He's saying you can take care of entering that personal relationship today. You can come and receive Christ and the wonderful gifts that He provides for you. And you can begin living a life with for, for sin forgiven in your life and the Holy Spirit living in you in, in a great way, in a powerful way. And that challenge is there for for you as well. Let's pray. Our Father, we're grateful that um, Jesus set such a great example of, of prayer and the diligence of prayer. We know He is our standard. He's our model. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. We owe everything to Him. And the closer we draw to Him and the more we live our lives in ways that mirror his priorities, and the way he lived and treated people, the, the greater influence we have with others, but most importantly, the closer we are to you. Often we're much like the disciples, Father. We, we pray, but we don't pray nearly as much as Jesus did. And it's not so much how much time we spend, but dear Lord, that we just make it not a burden and a duty. We just make it a part of our lives. And we pray that you'd help us to do that. Help us to yield and be, be willing to work on that practice, to, to make that a, a daily part of our existence. And not just something we do at a meal or something we do at bedtime or something we do when we're really in a bind. We just realize every day we walk through life with you. And it's to be a joyous experience, not a more difficult one. We need you, Lord. May we all walk away from here today with a personal relationship with you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you as part of our family here at Kimmel Heights. If you have not given your life to Christ and made that public through baptism, we would sure love to invite you to that. The baptistry is ready today. And uh, we look forward to, um, to those who will use that today and any of the rest of you that might be interested in a new beginning in Christ. And for all the rest of us, let's just draw near to Him and develop this habit of prayer um, out of love and, and set th thanksgiving for Him. Would you stand with us as we sing today a song of decision? And would you come, if you need to come and make a public decision today, I'd be happy to talk to you here at our back table. Um, for whatever your need is today, let us help. This morning, Drew and Riley Hancher uh, come to give their life to Christ and be baptized this morning. Uh, we are celebrating with them. So, Drew, I just want you to repeat your confession of faith after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God, and I accept him, and I accept him as my Lord, as my Lord and Savior. Your hand share upon your confession of faith. I now baptize you in the name of the Father.
Son, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Forgiveness of sins and a gift of the Holy Spirit. Will you repeat your confession of faith? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Riley, answer upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit.